This evening we have Louis Fishman joining us. Louis Fishman is an assistant professor at Brooklyn College, City University of New York. He's also the author of Jews and Palestinians in the Late Ottoman Era, 1908-1914. Mr. Fishman is a regular contributor to the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, where he writes on Turkish, Israeli, and Palestinian affairs. He divides his time between New York, Istanbul, and Tel Aviv. And Mr. Fishman is joining us from New York. Hello, Mr. Fishman. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so you're joining us from New York, the epicenter of the pandemic in the United States. I'd first like to ask you how you're doing and how the atmosphere in the city is. Um, we've heard in the news, obviously, that there's been tensions between the governor of New York and President Trump. Um, how are uh, things at the moment? Yeah, I think I think first of all, when we talk about New York, it really is the epicenter of New York. I mean, of the world of the of the breakout. If New York had been its own country, um, we here in, in New York would have been the highest per million rate. I mean, it was it's almost 700, 800 per million. I mean, it was it was substantial. And I think the thing about being in New York during this period is, you know, we were looking all the time. Um, I think, unfortunately, maybe being prejudgmental about Italy and what they were facing. Um, but what we saw in Italy were, were nightmare scenarios of hospitals collapsing. Um, thankfully, we didn't come to this in New York City. In New York City, with all its alarms going off, and we'll get to the, 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 the great tension that, was, that exists between Governor Cuomo and also the mayor de Blasio between the two actually, and President Trump. But we know early on, and I think I, it also gave me comfort as the numbers were rising, and as there was a greater fear that Italy was just right around the corner, that um, it wasn't going to be the case because um, I think New York, and of course, learning from Italy and Spain, um, prepared themselves and said, you know, we need field hospitals. In the end, very few people had to use these field hospitals, but it was good to know that they were there. Just personally, um, for the first, I mean, we've been in home now six weeks. I think March 12th was the last time um, we had a norm, some normalcy in our lives. Uh, I have only left my place four or five times because uh, it did hit hard. In Brooklyn or in Queens, I'm in Brooklyn, and I teach here at Brooklyn College. And unfortunately, we know, A, that it hits, um, you know, it's, it's an economic disparity. The people, the haves, are, are better off than, than the have-nots. So whether, whether it's, you know, Caribbean communities or other immigrant communities, including a large Turkish um, immigrant population, these communities were hit very hard. So I know from my students talking to them, um, it was, it was substantial, you know, you start scratching the surface and even my students, I had, you know, five or six thick, two or three of them I'm still in contact with. Um, it really, really hits hard. And sadly to say, we also had students that lost, you know, their parents, grandparents and other relatives. Okay. This is on top of the economic challenge, you know. Most Americans in you know lower economic levels live paycheck to paycheck, and that includes many people among the, the what what is perceived as the middle class. So I think this also the the you could really feel it in New York that this, there's a doubling the weight of the of, of the of the of the virus itself, meaning it was widespread. I can tell you up until about a week ago, sirens. It, they were howling all times, day and night. So I live at a sort of an intersection. So we would have sirens 24 hours a day. Thankfully, we see the number is going down now. It looks like that as almost as we reached the apex. And we were having over 800 people, about 800 people dying. Um, and now it's down to about the last two days, about um, around 400 in New York State, with most of those um, in New York City or right around New York City. So there is a decline, and the good news is we're hearing less sirens. Yes, I heard one a few minutes ago, but it's back to where it used to be almost, where you hear 
at an intersection in a big city, you will hear it. You will hear um, sirens all the time. So yes, it's it's turning out better. Let me add, um, there is has been quite a bit of tension between local governments, um, whether that's the the New York City government vis-a-vis -vis the New York State government, and the state government vis-a-vis -vis the federal government. And I think that that's something that we can we can focus on more when we talk about also about Turkey and understand that um, you know the United States. This decentralized system is really good sometimes, but in times of tragedy, it's really added to the, a, a greater amount of death. I think there's no doubt about it. I think there's no doubt about that Trump completely mis mismanaged um, this on a huge scale. So we have now about over 50,000 people dead. Um, this is the official number. Um, you know, we're going to talk about, I'm sure, with Turkey about people questioning the the official no numbers, but I'll tell you in the United States, they added, you know, 3,000 more people to New York because they said these people weren't counted, but for sure they're, they're coronavirus patients and where they had coronavirus, even if they didn't get tested. So definitely we can see that um, there is this question, is 50,000, yes, it's representative. We can use it as a benchmarker to understand, but it can be much more. The last thing I'll say about the American crisis and we're learning much more about it, is how hard it hit nursing homes. And the elderly have been hit really hard in this. Now, when we look at, once again, when we get to Turkey, we'll talk about the, the fact that there's no, really, there's no real culture of nursing homes. And I think that has caused the number to stay lower. In Italy, we know they have a very high uh, elderly, elderly, uh, older, older uh, citizens, older people, elderly. That's now becoming somewhat of a, in polit uh, not a politically correct word, but older citizens. Um, so, so we'll talk about that. So overall, to sum up the U.S. case, yes, there's a decline. Like Turkey, many places do not have full clampdowns, and we're seeing um, that some of the states trying to reopen are now dealing with rising numbers also. So the United States, is it's a mixed bag. New York, um, no doubt about it, we felt it hard. We learned from California and Washington that this can be contained. And we learned from New York that it can be contained. It's going to be important to see what happens going forward. Um, yeah, so Mr. Fishman, before we speak about perhaps the numbers, um, I'd like to ask you about uh, the, the management, let's say, models of both the U.S. and Turkey, which show similarities. As you mentioned, um, there have been uh, tensions between local authorities and President Trump, and the same has been the case here in Turkey, where um, there's been uh, some issues and confrontation between uh, opposition uh, party uh, municipalities. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, could you perhaps elaborate on these this confrontational approaches of, of both presidents and, and their unwillingness to take proper measures as advised by uh, medical experts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a great comparison. Very early on um, in the beginning of the crisis, um, I had been writing a, um, a few tweets about that really well. It's amazing to look at Cuomo and President Trump and look at Imamolu, Ekrem Imamolu, the, the, the mayor of, a very popular mayor of uh, Istanbul opposition, um, uh, GHP party opposition, with uh, the president of, of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan. Um, and there's no doubt, I think, in the, in the early months, the early, we're talking about not even months here, we're even talking about a month and a half. It seems, it seems like it's been months, right? But it's, it's been only about five weeks since Turkey first saw its case, first registered case, and we can talk about that later. But the, the important thing is, I think that this tension was obvious. With Turkey, I think the local governments really had their hands tied, and they weren't able to come out and shine as they wished they could have been because of a clampdown on, on their charity-based work, for example. You know, um, they even before, the government comes out in Turkey, come out with a, you know, collecting money to, to support um, people in their city. And this is certainly, I think anyone would find it hard to understand that this wouldn't be their right. And, you know, it could gain points against the government, 
but also there is this idea that municipalities help um, help their 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 own citizens also, or they have they have a certain amount of responsibility also. This is just not charity. This is a responsibility to take people, take care of people in your constituency. It's the basic idea of any system. And what do we have municipalities for? I think um, because the crisis in Turkey, on the other hand, has been overall managed pretty well. Um, I think the government, when I say managed pretty well, I'm talking about the overall um, consensus that there hasn't been a major breakout like in Italy or New York. Um, so, so it's one of these things that once the coronavirus hopefully passes and hopefully passes with minimal death possible in Turkey, and we will of course talk about that, those numbers, um, the ones that supported the local governor, governance will continue to support the governance. And, and that's a very high number, by the way. Mm -hmm. And the ones that are supporting, um, you know, the AKP party, the Erdogan's party or Erdogan um, are going to stay the same. I don't think there's going to be a huge, um, a huge difference. Now, if this would have backfired on the government and there would have been a lot, a lot larger debt, because people are questioning numbers in Turkey. But let's say that the numbers are wrong. Let's say that they've been minimalized. Let's say they're collecting data like places in the United States trying to put other, you know, heart issues that were other complications, other medical complications. That it really wasn't Corona it was this. Whatever the case is, even if you times turkeys by two or three, it would still be better than on many places that we're seeing. So I, I, I think in this sense, you, if it was something that happened in New York, for example, you would know about it because you would hear sirens. You would see your neighbors. You know, I mean, literally, I look from my view, I could see five, the, two weeks ago, I could see five or six ambulances on different streets, five different streets at the same time. So something like this would be quite obvious. We know that um, in Turkey, often the government, the main government, likes to minimize catastrophes, um, earthquakes, uh, starting all the way back to the Soma mine incident, different things like this, right? We know that they like to minimize uh, the bad PR or the lack of, of um, bad management of government because this is in, in government, all, all usually the way catastrophes are, are, are dealt with, it, it's upon the government. Okay, and we know that in Turkey that you can't hide this, you can't keep this quiet, meaning the, the opposition, even with all the limited press freedoms you have in Turkey, and definitely there are limited press freedoms, okay? Mm -hmm. Even with all those, we know that in Turkey, continuously, um, voices are raised and people hear these voices, like we do now, by the way. Um, we do now have internal voices in Turkey saying, this numbering is not correct. The death toll is much higher. Yes. I don't think that, I think people understand that this could be true also. I think people now in Turkey take statistics with a grain of salt at times and say, some what I, what I just said about the United States is we can use this as a benchmark. This might not be the exact number, but overall we can say that we have some, I, some idea of what is happening. Mm -hmm. Now let me go and just real fast say that I think perhaps interesting enough, you know, the United States, not like many, Turkey is very, is, is very status in the sense that many countries, like I work in Israel, of course, and Israel has one or two or three news channels and it's centralized. You know, the American case um, has something, there's something called local news in America. Every night, every day between five and six, every day between 11 and 11.30. So a lot of people are turning into the local news to get the stories of people dying. And there we get the we get more you know detailed information about you know this principal from this school, this rabbi from here, this imam from this mosque. We get these stories, and I think um, because of Turkish press freedoms already being limited, and be, because the overwhelming pro-government uh, media, for the most part, I think that's safe to say, um, it is sometimes hard. If there's not a major crisis, I'm talking about like in New York or like in Italy, it's some really, sometimes really hard to pinpoint 
how serious the crisis is. Mm -hmm. Because we know for one thing is that this and the pro-government people rightly so have been saying, you know what, our hospitals are prepared. And we know that there hasn't been a collapse in the hospitals. Mm -hmm. We know that the Bashak Shihe new hospital just opened, a very impressive hospital that's built by the government. So on the other hand, people know also from the opposition, they know that the hospitals are not the same thing as they were 20 years ago. And I think that's something important, you know, also among the opposition. And many people, I think, that are usually strong voices against the government, they've quieted their voices down during this crisis and said, you know what, it's not as bad as some of the people are trying to make it, you mm -hmm. know, make it be. Because there's a sense by, rightly so in America also, that, you know, they'll use anything against Trump as they can. In Turkey, they'll use anything against Erdogan as they can. And they'll exaggerate numbers or they'll make it worse than it really seems. Now, in the New York case, US case, because it's local news, we don't get the news stories of the, all the nurse, nursing homes that people are starting to talk about and the failure of the government. But that, that too comes out. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think it really is, I think it really is a, a mixed bag, mm -hmm. uh, a mixed bag. And perhaps if I can just bring this to a second to the issue of the health minister. Mm -hmm. I think early on the government, um, and, I, and I wrote about this during the first two or three weeks, I haven't, I haven't developed this since, but they really came out with a unique strategy. Usually all major topics of concern to the, to the citizens are dealt with Erdogan directly. Yes. Meaning it's Erdogan every day and it's Erdogan only. Yeah. Okay. Now, since I think that this could be also with the popularity of the local municipalities. Now, if we're going to say that this is just a big if, perhaps the government said, you know what, let's delegate this work to the Minister of Health and let him, Fahrettin Koja, do this and let Erdogan stand behind the lines. Mm -hmm. something, something that would have been extremely wise for Trump that done very early, by the way. Mm -hmm. Yes, because Trump early. has been, uh, unfortunately, we've, we've had to see him uh, really go down on uh, certain members of the media, uh, harshly rejecting all types of criticism and directly targeting uh, journalists. Um, and in that Absolutely. Sense, yeah, and in that sense, uh, President Erdogan, yes, has addressed the nation a handful of times in the past month and a half, but um, it's a significant drop in terms of his usual media presence. And uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, and Fahrettin. In, in fact, this reminds us. This reminds me. Reminds me. The press conferences remind me something of what it was like around in 2012, 2013 in Turkey when Erdogan would hold open press conferences and, 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 and remove press or, or, or get upset with different press vocally mm -hmm. in, front of, in front of cameras, which, which usually doesn't happen now. So we will have Koja, and I think what he has done, he has been able to really a, do some good PR for the government in the sense that, listen, he comes out and he shares in the middle of the night a photograph of Erdogan um, embracing an older woman. And so we know there's no doubt he is just not a health minister, but he is a health minister that is highly supportive of the government. I think there's no doubt about that. So he sends out these signals for whatever reason. Okay. But he has given a sense of security to the citizens overall. The fact, the transparency, and, and I will, we will get the numbers, the question of the numbers, but the transparency of every night giving numbers, and literally just before we logged in here, before we started this talk, I said, let me look at today's numbers. Because we know around 12 or 1 in the afternoon, the numbers come in. And I think for that reason, Koja has been the success, the government has, has for the first time in years, handled a crisis much better than they've handled any crisis that we've seen in the past mm -hmm. uh, couple years or yeah mm -hmm. and i think that is a major turning point 
Once again, I don't think in the long run this is going to change this way or this way, who supports or who doesn't support. But it does give a sense of security, whether that security, you know, it's like when I said they opened field hospitals in New York and I felt a sense of security. I was lacking, I was, I was literally saying, what happens even if I get, you know, if I fall and break my foot on the street, they're not, they're not gonna be able to take me in the hospital. Here we have something, it's a sense of security of citizens where they say, you know what? We're getting these numbers every day. They're in contact with us. And that's why when the interior minister, minister Soilu came out and declared oh, about three weeks ago, I believe, mm -hmm. a, a curfew within two hours, that's why it was such a, a major fiasco because what the interior minister did was he broke that trust that the government had built with the citizens that they were going to be open about this. Mm -hmm. And of course, we know that he resigned two or three days later because it wasn't just a fiasco, it was, a, it was putting you know, hundreds of thousands of citizens together running. Now, a lot of people said, oh, there were jokes going around. Look at one person went to get, I think, Prasa, leaks. He was walking on this young guy walking out with, with leaks. You know, what is he doing? But you can't do that because in anywhere in the world, you call a curfew, even with 48 hours, the internal fear you have is to go out and get anything. And we, we see in the United States, it was toilet paper. Everyone was running out to get toilet paper. Um, you know, so, so I think that this sense was the, uh, the interior minister Soilo broke this trust. And yes, he came back and people speculated you know, is this, you know, people can speculate all they want, but he came back. I think the idea that he came back also saved the government face because it showed continu continuity. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have major internal political fiascos happening during a crisis. So that was controlled very quickly by Erdogan who said, no, we're not going to let Soylu go. We're going to keep him. And now they're doing the implementing the different curfews, the, the two day, two day, and now a four day uh, curfew that started um, um, last night until Sunday morning. And let me say that with the, the major thing that needs to be said, and then and, and, and we can throw the ball back into your court, is that I think placing the older people under lockdown at 65, this is really serious. People were joking at first, but people under 65, cannot leave their house. I've talked to some people and they're right at that age and they're like, you know, uh, I can't leave my house, you know. Um, you know, there's funny stories of a, a woman who is 66 and the police come up and ask her, uh, you know, show us your ID. And she goes, well, of course I'm younger than that. Shame on you, you know, things like this. There were funny things happening, but we know that 65 are in the house and people under 20, except for, for some essential workers, are, are put in. Also. to the home. So we can talk about a Turkish model. Um, that might be a bit extreme. And, and this, this is where I can lead some of the more negative side of the things, negative side of, of the management. Because it, it's been managed well, but not completely well. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, you mentioned the 65 and plus year olds uh, being confined to their houses. And a matter of, as a matter of fact, they have started this application where uh, if they do uh, leave their homes, they receive a text message uh, on, their, uh, on their cell phone devices warning them to, to go back home. So they're really keeping um, the checks and balances uh, in that regard. But uh, another kind of uh, area which is, uh, has been problematic is the issue of masks, which mm -hmm. we're all you know, forced to wear if we do uh, go out on the streets, uh, but which we, which, which we are unable to reach. Absolutely, um, yes, yes. So th th this is yeah. one of the issues that hasn't been uh, yet resolved. I mean, you know, on, on paper, yes, there is a, a method to uh, go about it, but it's, it doesn't actually translate, translate practically. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, yes I, I mean, I think, I think there's, you know, the, the issues of the masks, only five masks, you can buy them, then, 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 then what do you do? Um, then people on the flip side, well, you know, in Europe and in America, they don't hand you out masks for free, so we should be thankful for, the, for, for this. 
Yes, I think if you're working every day, which many people still are working every day, um, especially the essential workers. I think overall, uh, Turkey mirrors um, the American case and other cases where there is a, a stay-at-home, you know, sheltered, encouraged. But for example, Florida, it took them very long to, to, to do a full lockdown. And Turkey is doing this. I wanted to, to spend some a few seconds and talk about if there is a Turkish model. And, and I think that if there is a Turkish model, where Turkey has failed is at going back to the, the, the publishing of the statistics. On one hand, it's giving security to the overall amount of, of the population, that there's transparency and stuff like this. But since it's not only been the New York Times, I think you know that there's a tendency in Turkey to say, anytime someone like me or other um, international people, long-term residents of Turkey that aren't Turkish citizens, is that, oh, we're always out to get them. And we're always just this. Well, the truth is that many people, there, there's, there's, there's a way, there's, there's plenty of Turkish people, citizens, politicians, that think these numbers are incorrect, especially when it comes to the death numbers. In medicals, one of the main medical associations also has questioned is that these aren't the correct um, numbers. And I think that perhaps is where Turkey's failure is. Yes, they've managed, they managed it in, in a few ways. Quickly to see what's going to happen in, in the long term of, of not having a lockdown. But without giving assurances that this indeed are the numbers, then Turkey in itself has undermined itself by not being able to be a model for the world. Meaning if we knew that, yes, the people that, I think it's clear that there were deaths before March 17th, for example. Mm -hmm. In the United States, we now find out that way a month, early February, someone in Santa Clara, California, had died from coronavirus before. We know that Turkey borders Iran and Iraq. We all talked about this very early on. And even if, you know, what, what I said was Turkey is, you know, they're jumping early on, they're jumping the hoops they need to jump, but they're not understanding the crisis in its totality. Mm -hmm. So yes, they closed down air travel. Yes, they closed down borders or partially borders. But by then, I think plenty of people had been infected. If we, all, if we have very little transparency about where the testing is being done, we have very little transparency of, of why such a low number in the southeastern areas when it is so close to the Iran-Iraq border. We have also the case that we know that coronavirus was widespread in Greece, pretty, I mean, pretty, not widespread, but pretty evident they had an issue with Greece, right? People coming back and forth from Greece and Turkey, there's so many people that do this on a daily and weekly basis for, for numerous reasons, whether business or, or pleasure or, or whatever. And we see that Greece, Greece's case has turned out much different than, than, than Turkey's. I mean, we have to remember that Turkey is number seven in the world, okay, in coronavirus cases. So there's no doubt that, there, that, that the greater picture is one of mismanagement, meaning um, that they didn't do enough early on. And that's where it brings us back to the American case. Because the American case really does, like you said earlier, mirror that, yes, they've done it, but they haven't done it fully. You know, there's not states implemented stay-home policies, but other states still haven't. Um, South Dakota still hasn't. You know, there's a, one, there's a one meat factory there where about 900 people are coronavirus infected. Okay? So... We don't get a sense in Turkey of where this is happening outside the major city centers. And I think with, with so, so if you go pro-government and you say, Turkey is, this is the pro-government life, Turkey has been an overall huge success story. Well, that's not really the case, but it has been a much better success story than Italy than, and the United States. Okay, and I think that's, I mean, everything is, everything is comparative here. Okay, so, so if they would be more open and say, you know, it's not really 2,000 deaths, but if we take these numbers and it's actually 5,000, 6,000, okay, then we could say, wait a minute, still there's something to the Turkish model. 
So we know that Turkey overall, overall, has, overall has a much younger population. So when you compare it to Italy, it makes sense that a meaningless Turkish people would be infected or, or would die from it. We know that America has nursing homes. Turkey, like we started, when I started to say at the beginning was Turkey, Turkey keeps the elderly at home with them and only right when they get very sick before death do they end up at a hospital. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, this is, and I think this is cultural difference. Yeah, yeah huge cultural differences. Um, Israel almost doesn't have nursing home culture, mm -hmm. but where they do, they have huge breakouts. Okay, so when we start trying to understand models, it, I think it's going to take us some time to understand, you know, how detrimental was the Swedish model versus other models. Mm -hmm. But definitely we can question this. And that is, that's where we get in the problem is that if you do not have a fully open, vibrant society where journalists can write what they think and not be afraid of implications, then we're never going to get the full picture. And that, in a way, if Turkey is a success story, that's a way of disappointment that for medically, medically speaking, that we could see that there was a very different case there. And that's where Turkey in itself undermines itself. It's internationally where people say, you know what, there's no free press, there's no this. You know, they go, they just go across the board and say, they're, you know, the normal mantra that people have about Turkey for the last, you know, four or five years, and they completely write them off. Uh, it's like China and it's like Iran, it's no different. Well, it's not really like China, it's not really like Iran, whatever Turkey is. But, but by not being fully open sometimes, then this undermines them. And, um, um, and I, think, I, think, I really think that, you know, Turkey has something to offer the world um, with their hospital systems, with their, there was one CNN article that was really interesting and said that Turkey is trying not to put people on ventilators. It was the exact same thing that a New York doctor said, that once they get on the ventilators, it's almost hard that they take them off it. And this is one of the me methods that they're using in Turkey. Now, Turkey also is using the anti-malaria drug, and there's a lot of controversy over this, if this is working or not. So I think if there would, had it been a more opening up, Turkey could provide very important information in the future. And that's going to, we're going to have to see how that plays out in the next yeah. few weeks. Well, here's hoping that um, all the leaders around the world listen to the medical experts uh, in order to kind of uh, have the less uh, possible ca positive cases and the less possible of deaths. We officially Absolutely. Have and politicians that listen to the medical experts. And I think um, in that sense, uh, both um, Ankara and uh, Mansur Yavash and Imam Olu in Istanbul have been critical to keep saying the Turkish thing, right? Meaning they are, have from the very beginning, have been calling the government for full, for full lockdowns. In retrospect, maybe the government is going to say, you know what, we did it without this. But without that opposing voice, you can be sure that many more people would have been dead today in Turkey. So this, this tension, this tension that we see in the United States and we're seeing in Turkey, in the end, the tension is, it, it's good it's there. And it's good that, you know, you, I, I get, the, I get the, the, the government overall, Turkish economy is in dire, in a dire situation now. A full lockdown, could totally bring the country down. This is the fear at least. This is the fear at least. This is a fear for many people in the United States as well. So you get the politicians versus, you know, local leaders that sometimes, you know, they're going to also have to, I mean, both local leaders, let's, let's face it, it, to be a mayor of any big city in the world today. You don't need to be a mayor of Ankara, Istanbul, but Istanbul, 18 million people. This is going to be a huge challenge for the municipality to pull through it as it is. And I think I would hope that 
that they're able to gain some of their powers back um, and move forward with this because it's something very, very necessary. The government also needs them, let's put it that way. It doesn't go, it's not one side. They, the, in this sense, in a crisis like this, what we've seen is that they really need each other in this case. Yes. And by not working together, this only causes more tragedy in the long run. And that's unfortunate. Yes, exactly. So hoping we can go beyond uh, politicizing the virus and think about all the citizens uh, equally. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Louis Fishman, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much. And hopefully we'll have better days ahead of us and that this won't last too long and um, that we won't see tragedy prolong it as long as it has already and not too much longer. Thanks so much for having me. Indeed. Thank you again.